Okay, I think we are going to get started. Hi everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sarah Warsi, and I am the Marketing Manager here at Sentia. Before we get started, just a friendly reminder that all attendees are automatically muted. If you do have any questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat window and they will be addressed at the end. So today we are delighted to be hosting this session alongside Maxeva, a global provider of innovative monitoring and DR solutions. We'll be focusing on their high availability suite and its impressive IBMI replication capabilities and how Sentia is partnering with Maxeva to deliver these solutions. Speaking on this topic today, we have Martin Norman and Ash Giddings from Maxeva, along with Paul Cudmore from Sentia. So a quick overview of our agenda. We will give a brief overview of Sentia. We'll give a bit of a deeper dive into the speakers. And then Paul will get into a brief overview of the Power VS and DR as a service as it relates to Maxeva. Then Ash will get into Maxeva's capabilities and functionalities. And then we will close the session with a live and interactive demo by Martin. So for those on the call that may be unfamiliar with the entire scope of what Sentia does, we just wanted to give a quick summary of our capabilities. So Sentia is a Canadian-based managed IT solutions provider with a strong national and international presence. For 16 plus years, we have been helping businesses of all sizes improve upon and optimize their IT operations, giving them more time back to focus on business growth. We have a great team of skilled experts and we work with businesses of all sizes and a wide range of industries, including finance, manufacturing, insurance, and higher ed, just name a few. We have extensive expertise in areas such as advanced virtualization, business continuity, Microsoft, networking, cybersecurity, and of course, cloud. Uh, what sets us apart, of course, is our un unique ability to conceptualize, design, implement, and manage our solutions. And we have strong relationships with complementary technology leaders, such as Maxeva, of course. So about the speakers, we've got Paul Cudmore, who is uh, Sentia's senior technical architect. Paul brings over 25 years of IT experience, and he specializes in optimizing data center operations through IBM Power Systems, cloud computing, automation, and automation technologies. Ash Giddings is the product manager at Maxeva, and he is an advocate for IBM, specializing in systems management, high availability, DR, and cloud computing. And he is also a frequent speaker at IBM I user group events globally. Martin Norman is a seasoned IT professional with 40 plus years of experience in IBM Power Systems monitoring, security, and compliance. He is a business development subject matter expert at Maxeva, consulting with Fortune 100 and 500 companies globally, and is also very actively involved in industry events. So with all of that said, I would like to pass it over to Paul to get the session started. Paul, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to briefly go over some of the uh, features of the PowerVS IBM Cloud offering and also an offering we provide called uh, DR as a Service, which utilizes Maxeva. So um, I just want to give you a quick introduction in that. Uh, next slide, Sarah. Uh, so the, the next few slides I, I've taken from an IBM presentation about PowerVS. Uh, so there might be some non-Maxeva related things here, but the important thing about this slide is to note some of the key uh, workloads that IBM is targeting and we're targeting for uh, PowerVS. And the, the key one uh, we wanna look at here is the IBM I workloads, obviously. Um, <clears throat> IBM I, is, as you know, is probably not something that <laughs> you can just run anywhere. Uh, it's very specific to IBM Power. Um, you can get IBM Power in other clouds, but um, why not get it from uh, the company that actually produces the IBM equipment, the hardware? Uh, so uh, one of the best uh, places to run IBM I in the cloud would be the IBM Cloud. Uh, uh, next slide, sir. Um, some of the uh, some of the um, 
uh, or one of the key advantages of using uh, IBM Power Virtual Servers is that you're not uh, forced to re-platform your system. If you wanted to move to the cloud and you weren't going to run it on IBM I, you'd have to rework your application, maybe find a new provider. Uh, but uh, moving to Power VS is completely frictionless. It uses the same hardware and underlying technologies that you would use uh, on your on-prem. So there's no there's no um, you know risk on moving your your application up to the cloud. Uh, everything will work as it works on-prem. So that's one of the key advantages of uh, uh, basically lifting and shifting your workload to the cloud. So. Um, uh, no, no risk in trying to, you know, change it from whatever application you're using to whatever would run in Azure or AWS. Uh, next, next slide, sir. Um, one of the other advantages of running in the IBM Cloud is there is a global presence for Power Virtual Servers. This is this is just the the map for Power Virtual Servers. Um, there are worldwide locations in almost every geography, so there there would be some. Uh, location that would would uh, <clears throat> work for your DR workloads, for example, um, or if you have data residency requirements, um, you, you can uh, certainly uh, find a location that would suit your needs um, anywhere in the world. Uh, uh, many locations in North America and South America, uh, Europe and the Asia Pacific uh, region is fully fully covered for um, power virtual servers. Um, one of the advantages, and I'm going to, IBM's not on the call, so I can cut this slide up a bit. <laughs> they're, they're saying that um, these costs can be eliminated. I'm going to say that they're included, uh, but the way you, you would save costs is that you only have to buy what you need. Um, for example, if you're buying a, a server for an on-prem application, you have to buy the whole server. You, and if you only need one core, you're buying a server with four cores at minimum and you're deactivating cores. So you're paying maintenance on that whole server. Um, you have to uh, you have to buy the storage and the networking uh, needed for that server. Um, you have to pay hardware maintenance. You also have to uh, manage that server by upgrading the hardware and and or sorry the firmware on the hardware. Um, any software underlying like virtual I/O servers, all the storage has to be maintained. All the uh, the switches and everything connecting it all together has to be managed by your your uh, local IT department, uh, but if you move that to a Power Virtual Server, most of those um, uh, costs and and um, administrative overhead uh, would be uh, reduced or eliminated. So that's one of the advantages of, uh, of moving to the cloud in general. Um, but specifically uh, with Power VS, things like uh, IBM hardware maintenance, you don't have to worry about that. Um, software maintenance is included, so you always have a supported platform. Um, uh, things like that uh, that you don't think about that you're paying for with on-prem um, uh, is is eliminated with the cloud. Next slide. So we're focusing on uh, four different offerings with Power Virtual Servers. Um, uh, th we find these are the easiest ones to justify and uh, some of the uh, best use cases for Power Virtual Servers. Um, it's easy to deploy a test dev uh, environment in the cloud. Um, if you're running out of capacity, you don't have to purchase new servers. They can be quickly deployed. Uh, there's no lead times for purchasing the servers. So it's a quick way if you have a, a, a short term project uh, that needs some resources, uh, you can easily deploy it in the cloud without a huge investment. Um, obviously, DR environments, we're talking about Maxava, and one of the functionalities for Maxava is DR. Um, so, but this this applies to AIX, uh, IBM I, any other uh, Linux that would run on power. Um, uh, so any of those workloads, uh, if you need a DR environment, you can quickly deploy something without having to build your own data center or, uh, you know, um, worrying about all the hardware and, and implementing it. Um, you can even move your production to the cloud if you're if you're trying to eliminate on-prem data center costs. Uh, we're happy to help you uh, plan and migrate your your cloud migration for your production environment as well. And one of the things we're focusing on today is uh, IBM I DR as a service um, using Maxeva. It's an offering. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, Sarah, it's an offering that we're uh, 
we're presenting here that um, you can you can have a fully managed DR for IBM I that we would host. Um, we include MaxAva licenses. Uh, we set up the uh, DR environment and uh, it includes uh, two annual tests of your DR um, with our support. So uh, we're really uh, you know interested in helping you get your IBM I DR as a service uh, set up and running. Now, this isn't the only way to use MaxAva. I don't want to say this is what you have to use MaxAva for. There are many use cases for it, but we think this is one of the ideal ones that um, uh, you can you can take advantage of MaxAva's uh, technology. And and with that, I think that's the end of my my part. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, as as Sarah mentioned before, we uh, provide managed services. We do remote monitoring, high availability clustering, and we do uh, EDR and endpoint detection and response, or some just some of the additional services that we offer. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Um, we're going to just launch a very uh, quick poll right now. So uh, just give me one second here. Okay, so hopefully everybody on the call will see this on their screen shortly. Just hit submit after you've um, made your choices and we'll we'll go from there. And it's over to you, Ash. Perhaps you want to speak to the results of the poll first before getting started. Thank you, everybody, for your participation. Yes, indeed. Let me just have a look in the chat. So the question we asked was, where are you housing or where do, where do your servers, IBMI servers, live at the moment? And we see by far the biggest number is on-premise at 85 uh, percent and i think that's that's pretty typical it changes a little bit from region to region but what we have seen definitely over the last 18 months to two years is there is a lot more interest in and around cloud and public cloud such as power vs now where people were dipping their toe into the water with maybe a little bit of dev and test uh, we do see production workloads going into the cloud now. People are a lot more familiar with the concept and a lot more trusting. So I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about Maxava and three of the solutions that we have in our kit bag. So a little bit about Maxava. We've been around really since the turn of the century, maybe a little bit before then. We are partner driven, so we don't sell software to end customers is all driven through partners and we offer 24 by 7 support so we have people in quite a number of regions actually we have quite an overlap in those regions um, we have lots i think that number is probably a little bit low there are definitely more than 2000 software installations but because we we drive the business through partners we're not sure of the exact number and i guess one thing to say is the slider or the, the box on the right there, Cloud DR. We've kind of been working in and around the cloud from before it was actually called cloud. So we kind of know what we're doing in this space. It's um, it's it's as we say in the UK, it's our bread and butter. Here's a few logos here. Many of these you'll be familiar with, but I like to share this because it shows it shows the the breadth of customers that we have. There are some some very large environments there. This is not all disaster recovery to the cloud. Some of this is high availability between two of their own data centers. Some of these were competitive swap outs, but you can see the breadth. So there are some very large companies there. There are also some, some smaller companies there as well. So Ash, it really I'm doesn't so matter. sorry. Ash, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Um, are you? Um, we're on slide 16 on the deck. I just want to make sure that's in sync with um, what you're what you're sharing right now. I, I just just ah, want to double right. check. Yes. <laughs> ah, um, there's a button there. Let me do that. Yeah, I apologize. Just want to make sure that everybody's seeing um, uh, what what you're what you're speaking to in relation to what we're seeing. Yes, thank you. Are you seeing the logos now? Uh, so I am I am driving the presentation. So yeah, right here I'm I'm on this slide. So if you can just let me know when you want me to transition, that would be great. Okay, no problem at all. Thank you very really, much. Yes, 
Yes. Yeah, just just to illustrate the I guess the, the breadth and the, the different verticals that we operate in, it really doesn't matter. To us, an IBMI is an IBMI. There's some big ones, there's some small ones, there's some that have many millions of transactions a minute, um, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please, Sarah. Uh, wonderful. So we're actually at our second poll. Excellent. Thank you, Ash, for that. Um, I am going to launch our second poll of the session. So give me one moment, please. Okay, um, there you go. Um, this one, you can choose multiple choices if it's applicable. Thank you. Fantastic. So this this, is, this one is a, a straight straw poll, really, just to gauge what kind of versions are being run out there in the IBMI world. And it's good to see there are some 7.4s and some 7.3s out there. Um, a decent mix of 7.1s as well. So sometimes people get stuck on older versions due to the, the nature or the, the, the family of hardware they're running. So just be sure, there's actually a, a table on the Maxava website that talks about when those particular versions are supported until. It's worth checking that out because you tend to have to pay um, extended support, more costly support for the older versions. So I'm gonna talk about three solutions uh, today. The Maxava's kind of three main solutions. That's Monitor, Monitor MI8, Maxava Security and HA Enterprise Plus. Thanks, Sarah. So these solutions, the areas that these solutions cover are proactive monitoring and alerting, critical data protection, and then probably what we're spending most of the time in and around today, and what Martin's demonstration will cover. So that's Maxava HA. So that's immediate failover in a disaster. So we're gonna talk about that and then demonstrate it. Thank you, Sarah, next slide. Thank you. So we'll start off with Enterprise Plus, please. Next slide. Fantastic. So Enterprise Plus in the, I guess, in the, the traditional world, um, you've typically got two servers and these used to be on premise. So you've got a production server sitting there on the left and you've got a, a, a DR server or a backup server or a target server. Lots of different terminology that gets used these days. Um, and what Maxava HA Enterprise does, it replicates in real time what you'll need to run your business on the DR server should you ever need to invoke. Now, this is data objects. It's the integrated file system or the IFS, which can be very troublesome for some solutions to replicate. Um, also, IBM MQ as well. We've seen quite an uptick in people using MQ. So this is Maxava HA Enterprise. It has an awful lot of self-monitoring and self-healing. So it, it has a very few, sorry, it requires very few minutes on a daily basis to actually check that it's running. If there is a problem, it will try to fix it. If we can't fix it, it will come and tap you on the shoulder to tell you that there's a problem or it will tell Sentia that there is a problem as well. So self-monitoring, there's alerting, there's self-healing. You can also simulate a failover as well. So this is often the first step to a, a full roll swap. We simulate the production box disappearing or suffering some kind of disaster. And we bring the user base up, we point them to the DR box and they can have a look at the data and they can make sure everything is synchronized. So a very powerful solution. As I say, traditionally, and many years ago, this used to be all on premise. We then saw some, some trends starting to service with people using power clouds, such as Centia. Now there's a mixture of, there is some on premise still, but it, it's definitely reducing, but power clouds, partner power clouds and public uh, 
a public cloud such as Power VS or Power Virtual Server is 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 prevalent now. And to Maxava, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where these boxes are. We just need a couple of ports open, and that is fine. Next slide, please, Sarah. I have an image here to show it's browser based, so you can you can configure, you can monitor, you can manage Maxava from a browser. You can also do it from a GUI. In fact, we had a GUI before we had a green screen. And for those that still prefer the green screen, you can manage it from the green screen as well. So it really doesn't matter. It's horses for courses, as we say. Thank you, Sarah. Next slide. So just really to, to, to summarize HA Enterprise, we do use an incredibly little amount of CPU on the source or the production machine. The way Maxava has been written and developed means that we don't need any core jobs running on your production server. All of the overhead takes place on the target or the DR box. So that's very attractive to some. And I know some other solutions do tend to chew away at CPU, which gets in the way of production workloads. So we don't do that. I mentioned the IFS, the Integrated File System, before. Again, it can be an Achilles heel for some solutions. We allow um, an unlimited number of apply sessions within Maxava. Typically, people to even big environments tend to have three, four, sometimes five that handle the IFS. But you can go, it's typically unlimited, but it's definitely five or lower. And we find the way the software has been written it's incredibly fast and incredibly efficient. It's worth mentioning command scripting function. This is, uh, how do I describe this? Command scripting function is very powerful and people use it not just for um, kind of HADR related tasks, but also for system administration type tasks as well. So a command scripting function, you could, it, it's basically a label. You call it a label. Maybe you might call it end of day or something. And then under that end of day label, you might have a series of commands that you typically run or would run in a, in a manual situation. You might call some programs. You can put all those under a single label, under this maybe end of day label. And then you can initiate that label and that runs all those tasks for you. So it's very, very powerful. There's no programming, there's no developing skills needed. It's all under that label. And then finally, in HA Enterprise, we support all the way up to present day 7.5, all the way back to 5.3. So if you do have an old release, it's not a problem to us. Thank you, Sarah. The second solution I'm going to talk about is MI8. So MI8 allows you to monitor four different platforms typically. So that's IBM I, of course, AIX, Linux, and Windows. And what you see here is uh, it's kind of a summary screen. On the left-hand slide there, we can see that we're monitoring four servers or four systems, and we have one in error. And on the right-hand slide there, the right-hand image, the one in error is on the left. It's the hexagonal red uh, image. The other three are fine. We can't quite read the text on there, but you can see at a glance that you have a problem. Now, MI8 lives totally in the cloud. It's got that word again, cloud, lives totally in the cloud. There's no on-premise uh, hardware required. The way we monitor MI8, we establish uh, an SSL connection between the on-premise server, IBMI in this case, and MI8 living in the cloud. Once we've established that, we perform all the monitoring from the cloud. And again, some other solutions perform it on the actual IBMI itself. It's an overhead. We push all that data up to the cloud, all that performance related data, and we do our rule checking in the cloud. So we're super efficient. Thank you, Sarah. Next slide. And if you click through the animation here, fantastic. So MI8 allows you to monitor um, kind of everything from the bottom up. So if you start at the hardware layer, 
you could typically monitor uh, QSIS message, uh, QSIS OPA, QHIST, kind of anything that tends to generate and mean there's a hardware related error, maybe a disk error. So we can pick those up. We then start to layer that up and we, we can look after the operating system. So any quirks or peculiarities that appear in the operating system, again, we can monitor and push that up to the cloud console. And we start to layer that up. So it doesn't matter what application you're running. It doesn't matter what form of high availability you're running. If it's Maxava, great. We can monitor that in depth. If it's other solutions, we can still monitor the, the moving parts of it. And then performance and storage, they come uh, preloaded as well. So typically, we would we would create monitoring rules. It's all web based. We'd create monitoring rules, and we would create what we call an action. So, what do you want to do if that threshold is breached or that inquiry message is seen? And typically, most people would send a, a an alert to the MI8 console. They might send an email. They might send an SMS. All of that can be built into MI8, and you can also escalate alerts too. So you might push an alert to the console to begin with. If it's still there 10 minutes later, send an email, 10 minutes further, further still, an SMS. So the alert comes and finds you or whoever's responsible for managing your environment. So that's escalation. It also dovetails and can feed into ticketing solutions as well. So it's a very, very powerful solution. Next slide, please, Sarah. So we often get asked, where should I start with monitoring? So MI8, you can, you can create what we call templates. So here's an example. This was actually a Windows template here, where we're monitoring things such as CPU, disk, memory. Um, we're monitoring whether there's a process actually running. We're actually looking inside a log file for the word error appearing. We're also looking in event logs. So we've we've lumped all of those rules together in a single template called Windows template. And we can apply that template to one or to a thousand and one servers. It really doesn't matter. If we were to make a change to that template, that rule set would get automatically propagated to the end nodes automatically. So we tend to find that people get started with templates. They apply a, a base or a, a foundation level of rules, and then they would have individual rules on individual servers. So it's a great way to get started. Thank you, Sarah. Next slide. So I guess just to sum up MI8, it's all cloud-based. You don't need any additional hardware. Once that connection, that SSL connection is established, you're up and running. It's all browser-based. You don't particularly need to know the platform even. So if you've got some, maybe some Linux or some AX to monitor and you don't, you're not as comfortable on those platforms, it doesn't matter too much. It's all browser based. And it's flexible licensing as well. That's really geared towards uh, partners who have maybe swings in customers from a, a quarter to quarter basis. Thank you, Sarah. Next slide. So before we uh, we see Martin's demo, I'm just going to talk very briefly about Maxava security. So this is a, a new offering that you'll see kind of hit the shelves in the, in the next month or so. So typically what happens in high availability is any, any changes that take place on the source machine get replicated to the target machine. That's, that's HA doing its job. If there's any bad uh, updates, on that source machine, whether intentional or accidental, they also get replicated as well. That's HA doing its job. So we've thought outside the box. If you could just enter through that, please, Sarah. And what Maxava Security allows you to do is to define rules over, over critical data, critical files. So on the left-hand screenshot there, we are actually monitoring, what are we monitoring? We're monitoring four members there. And what you can do is you can say, I, with Maxava Security, I'm going to allow changes to those members from an individual, a group of individuals, 
maybe from certain programs or from certain interfaces. So you might say that data can be updated by SQL, but never by um, DFU or never by FTP. Or that uh, that group of finance users, they're allowed to make changes to it, but nobody outside that group is. And while Maxava security doesn't prevent the changes from taking place, what it does is whenever there is a change made, we look at our rules and decide whether it's a, an allowable change or not. If it's not an allowable change or an authorised change, we do two things. We generate an alert to a message queue, and that's where MI8 comes in, or your own monitoring tool, which will pick it up and tell someone about it. We also do something else which we think is really powerful. We capture a snapshot of that file prior to the change, prior to the potentially unauthorized change taking place. And Sarah, if you just enter through here, please. And oh, on to the next screen, please. And here's, here's a very busy slide here. So we're, we've, we're looking after six servers here. The five on the right hand side are all, all good. The one on the left has got a number of alerts. And we have uh, an alert which has been enlarged on the right hand side there. I'm not sure if that comes through, but it's an unauthorized change to a, a particular file from a particular user. So what we've done, we've told someone about it and we've captured a snapshot. And that snapshot can be stored anywhere. It can be stored locally, a remote IBMI, maybe the cloud is a good use case for that, or even on a, a different server, on a Windows server. So typically any server you can FTP to. So for some, this would dovetail with high availability. For others, maybe this is a, um, a step into the, the, the HA world, really. It gives you some form of protection, maybe on older boxes where you need some form of protection and you can't justify the full HA DR gambit. Thank you, Sarah. So just to summarize Maxava security, exception-based alerting will come and tell you if there's something that looks maybe a little bit suspicious based on the rules you've created. It interfaces not just with MI8, but also with any other monitoring tool or SIEM tool that you might have. We've got that data captured before the potential bad change. So you could recover your data quite easily. And I think it adds a, another layer to security. It's not going to replace any existing security you have, such as exit points or maybe object level security, but it adds another layer and it captures that snapshot for you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Ash. That was great. Um, now we're going to move on to Martin, who is going to do a live demo for us. Martin, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, hopefully my screen is now displayed. And uh, let me just make one change there. That's great. Um, yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. So what I want to do is give a little bit of a hands-on um, intro to um, to what you can see with, with two of those products that Ash just mentioned there, the HADR product called Enterprise Plus and also the monitoring. On the screen at the moment, we can see a um, IBM 5250 session for the system up there on the top right called C70, etc. That's a um, test system at Centia. And then we have, and you see here, this is in a non traditional color. We have a teal color, I believe that's called. Um, and for my other system, which is the PowerVS uh, target server, we're going to use with the system name of DRSYS at the top right, which is the more traditional green on black, okay? So those are two of the interfaces that we'll use uh, here. And just I'm gonna jump through some of the other ones. So we have, um, Ash mentioned, we, had, um, we have a browser-based management tool that you can use. So I have this open for that DRSYS um, uh, server at PowerVS. Um, and I'm going to use this uh, a little bit later on. I've also got a 
view of the monitoring tool I've logged on as my administrator profile through the cloud. And it says there, there are six systems that you're looking after. All of them are okay. So everything's good. You can go back to your normal work. Okay. And now I've got a few of the screens I might share as well at the same time. So the first thing I want to talk about is one of the items that uh, that both Paul and, and Ash mentioned was the importance of of um, of not having an impact on your production systems. Uh, this um, active job display on the production or the pseudo production system, it has three jobs running in the Maxava subsystem there. Um, one of them is to do with making sure it stays healthy and active and the remote journal monitor is that job there, make sure everything's good. The other two are actually to do with integrity checks. That's all we have running on there. If I jump across to my uh, target server and look at the active jobs there in that same subsystem, the Mac server subsystem, I've got a whole range of jobs which are active. And those are the ones that are doing the, the main work, the heavy lifting. They're doing the receipt of all the changes to data and objects that's arriving from the other system. And it's going to process them and get them replicated and changed into your target system so you're synchronized between the two um, as quickly as possible. Okay, um, we can see there on this this uh, group of jobs called data. It's to do with replicate. I defined it uh, as the word data, but it's for replicating anything. Um, there are five jobs which are doing the processing. Uh, those, what we call our apply jobs, you could have many, many more than that. Uh, it's very flexible and it's a very, very um, clean way of processing those changes. OK. Um, I'm going to go into the um, green screen management tool. So I'm just going to go up and choose a previous command. Um, so this is the green screen version of the management tool. Uh, if you recall, when we looked at the um, the browser version of this, same thing. We had these two things here called data IFS. Those are just random names. I've called these things called configurations. And a configuration is a definition of what you have told us to replicate from your production system into the Power VS cloud. And if I look there on the target server, we have two jobs which are active, and that's why when I looked at that subsystem, sorry, the active jobs and that subsystem, uh, there were a whole set of jobs there. And if I do the same thing, and if I look over here at the green screen command uh, on the production system, those are regarded as inactive. So in its normal state, when production is this system, those configurations are, act, are, are inactive. They don't need to be active because all of the real work is being done on the other system. Now, within here, I can do various things. I can go into a display that will tell me a little bit more about, oops, sorry, uh, a little bit more about that um, definition. Um, and I can go into the status and it will tell me everything that's being replicated. We can see there it's saying, yeah, within my demonstration libraries called ERP, um, all files and all commands and all display files are defined for me to replicate. So I've already set this up. So that's one of the important things working with Centia and working with Maxava. We will get this set up for you. And this is a system here that already is in a state where um, it is, it is already replicating, and I'll show you how that replication is working. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go, before I go on from here, I'm just gonna go into the tools area just so you can see these things as well. So from the same menu, and you can also do the same things, and we'll look at this in a while from the browser uh, management tool, you can do things like, um, run what we call patrol max that's one of the jobs that's running actively in production system that's our integrity check it, it checks to make sure everything syn synchronized it does resynchronizations partial resynchronizations etc we also have a, a an audit function so if there is a discrepancy between the production system and that target system that's where you would find the results of those audits and then again as ash mentioned during the call uh, sorry, during his part of the call, we have a command scripting function, which is a 
uh, a non-compiling um, processes language that you can use both within HA, within the monitoring tool, and also within your within your own processes as well. Okay. All right. So I'm going to come out of here. Um, so I'm going to show you, as I said, this system's already been set up for you, um, all very healthy. Um, so what I'm going to do is replicate a simple file. I'm going to create an absolute new file and show you how it appears and jumps from one system to the other. So uh, the way I'm going to do this, I'm just going to look on my production system. Um, actually, I'll come back to that. I'm going to jump over to the DR system and I'm going to look to see whether there is a file called Sentia in my demonstration library. And it says, no, you do not have any files of that name on that server. Uh, and I was doing some prep work before we came on the call. So I'm just going to replicate this command down. I'm going to create a new file called Sentia. And I'm going to uh, jump quickly from there to there, do a refresh. And we can now see that on the other computer, on the PowerVS server, as quickly as that, there is now a file called Sentia, and if I want to look at the details of what's in there, I can just query that file. And we can see there, yeah, that's all my customers. I, I do a lot of work with uh, supermarkets, so this is various names of supermarkets. Um, and that has replicated over. So that is an example of the basic replication we are picking up. The creation of a new object we're picking up the permissions the ownerships making sure that's all we, we have all that information all of that's done initially on the production system and then we replicate that over with all of its data to the target server at the same time and again that was just a simple creation of an object I'm just, if i just want to do the same thing i want to make a, a, a small change to one of my records um, let's say I pick the first one down, um, and I'm just going to change that first record in my file and change one of the, the details for my supermarket, the Acme supermarket, to say here. If I jump across to here and just refresh that command, we can see there that the details came across. So that's what we're doing. We're doing real-time replication now. We are making sure... Uh, that there is integrity between the two systems um, there. So that's good. I'm just moving on to my next page. OK, um, this is not just for data. As I said, it's for uh, objects as well. So, for example, if I have a look on this system, um, I can. I'm just going to just check some programs. So I'm going to look on this system at um, whether there are any programs on here on my DR system that begin with letter A in my demonstration library. And I'm going to do the same thing on my production system as well. And yep, we can see there that on the production system, there's three programs which begin with the letter A in my demonstration library. And they're also there on the DR system. Um, but I've been very stupid. I've allowed a programmer to get onto this target server. Maybe they were doing some checks to make sure everything was OK. Uh, but they've got on here. They forgot what system they're on and they've gone and deleted those two objects. So now I have no objects um, on that system with that name, with the, with the programs with a name beginning with A. They're still there on the production system, but there isn't a synchronization problem between those two. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go to uh, the command line from here, and I'm actually going to run a command. Just copying that from my other session to save a bit of time. Here we go. So I've run an audit. I go to here and do a refresh those two objects have come back. So there's integrity checking. There are audits and there's various other health checks to make sure your systems say stay in the synchronized state um, as much as possible. 
Now, I know I, I don't have a great deal of time left, but I wanted to show you a little bit of how the HA software interfaces with the monitoring tool. Uh, so as we were, we were on that screen there. So as I said, this is a um, uh, a landing page for when I log in as my administrator. If I drill down into what, one of our other views, I can see the six systems that I'm looking after. But actually today, I'm just going to focus on two of those. So I'm going to pick out the system, oops, the production system there, and that's the Power VS system as well. I'll just get rid of my filters. So I've got a display here which is showing me that those two systems are healthy. If they had any problems, they would change color, they would light up, and they would notify me. And the first thing I'm going to do is make sure make something go wrong because it will be a very dull demonstration if I don't do that. And I'm going to go across to the um, browser management tool. And as we can see there, there is a configuration there which defines what uh, IFS replication we want on the target server and I'm going to change it to a inactive state and submit that. It's a slight delay because of the distance between where I am and where all these systems are. That's why I've been using mostly the green screen. screen it's faster that way. Uh, but this will come back and it will show me. Um... Okay, that's not finished yet, but it will finish in the background. So what's going to happen is an icon will appear on this screen to tell me that the system has noticed something that it doesn't like to do with the DR system. Let me just check if that's finished yet. No, it hasn't. That was working so fast. OK, there we go. Good. Um, so it will, over the next few minutes, change this screen and it will tell me that that IFS configuration is in the wrong status. I'm also going to make some other things go wrong because Sentia will be looking after this PowerVS DR system for you, and there are other things that they might need to, to, to know about. And I'm actually going to make some things go wrong. As we can see here, I'm allowed to run commands back from my browser back to that system called DR system by entering my unique pin. I can make some problems occur. I click run. And over the next few minutes, just while we're looking at this, these alerts will come in. So, I, um, Sarah, I recognize I think I've got about three minutes left here. So I will, I think uh, these alerts will start to appear very shortly, but I will stop so that we can um, have a roundup session towards the end. No problem. Thank you, Norman. Sorry, Martin, my apologies. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I have three first names and three last names, so oh, it's always go. confusing. So, <laughs> okay, so the the first of the icons has appeared. So the um, the target server it's saying, yeah, you've got something wrong with that system. Um, the configuration called IFS. It's given me a, a, a generic um, notification that there's something wrong, but there are other ways it's going to notify me as well. If I go across to my other browser session. Um, if uh, that hasn't arrived yet. So I'm going to get an email shortly to tell me that there is something wrong with there. I'm also, um, oh, there they are. I'm starting to get these messages from my DR system. If I click on that, uh, I'm getting other messages appearing because if I go back to my MI8 display, uh, I'll see other alerts starting to appear there. Uh, if I actually have a display of what's currently on my phone, I'll just make that a little bit larger. Make that larger there, move that to the side. Um, we'll, we'll see that not only am I getting emails, but I'm also getting text messages to my phone about these things that it found wrong on the target server. So I've just picked out a few examples of things gone wrong. So this one at the bottom here, it's saying, ah, someone's changed a system value. Maybe they've changed the password strength so that this system is no longer as secure as it should be. This one here, maybe there's a hardware error. So we're getting this message, contact your hardware service provider because there's a, um, there is a problem maybe with a disk or with a tape drive. We have my IFS message from the HA software that allowed me to, to be notified that something was happening there. And another one that just popped here, maybe on the disaster recovery system on the backup server, the target server, whatever we call it, maybe you make sure that your applications never run 
by keeping some subsystems inactive because you don't want applications running on there because that's not what it's there for. But we've just noticed that the QBatch subsystem should not be active um, on the target. Now, one thing we can do as well is we can um, perform some interaction from this browser back to the IBM I. So if I want to, I can bring up a script and I could say, for example, on DR system, enter my pin. I know that's not the right one. I could end that QBatch subsystem from my browser. So whether I'm running a tablet or my desktop, a laptop, my phone, I can send an authorized command with security checks back from my browser to run that on the IBM I. But I'm actually going to use a slightly different method to do that. So we can see here that on my phone in the text messages, I've also got a text message about the fact that someone started QBatch on the target server. It shouldn't be active. Um, and what I can do is I can enter a response. So if I use the pin that is attached to that message just above, I can say run a command to end a subsystem called QBatch. And it will send that instruction back from my phone through the cloud monitoring MI8 tool back to the IBMI and it will end that subsystem should it so because it should not be active. So as you can see, we've got a monitoring tool that will not only look for the critical things on an HA system and help you to, to administer them by allowing you to restart the IFS configuration if somebody did it incorrectly or um, if they started the wrong subsystem or held a job queue or whatever they did, we can notify you and we can tell you by phone that we can do text to voice as well by text message, by email, and also by having it on the screen as well, okay? Um, and just very briefly before we move on to uh, to uh, wrap up for the session today, um, the monitoring that we do, you can also do on a production system as well. So if you want to monitor your applications, the messages generated by applications, the number of jobs running, for those applications, if you want to watch the audit journal for security events, if you want to look at um, performance, disk space, hardware faults, etc., you can also define rules for all of that. I focused here on just showing you the sort of alert that you might want um, Sentia to be notified about for your DR system running on that PowerVS in the cloud. Um, there are many other things that I could talk about today, and I'm sure if, uh, if you're interested, we can arrange a more direct demonstration. Um, but I'll hand back to uh, to Sarah now, if that's okay. That's great. Thank you so much, Martin. That was wonderful. So uh, before we wrap it up, we're going to just have um, a few minutes for some questions. So if you just give me one quick second here. Uh, okay. Okay, here we go. I can now see it. Wonderful. So I'm just going to jump right over. Just we had to navigate forward. Okay, so now is the time for just um, the last few minutes. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to share them in the chat and we'd be happy to address them. Okay, I do think we actually have a question coming through, which is wonderful. So this question is for Ash. Uh, we have somebody asking, um, if I'm looking to migrate to Sentia, do I need to purchase Maxeva high availability? No, good question, Sarah. Uh, no, you don't, actually. Um, we have a, an offering we call Migrate Live. And what that entails, basically, it's a it's a short term uh, use or short term licensing use of Maxava HA, typically three months. Um, it can be extended month by month after that. Uh, it's a short term rental. 
of Maxava HA software, along with some um, some tried and trusted experts from Maxava that will guide you through that migration. Um, we do lots of these, especially to cloud now. Um, we, we have very few migration conversations without the word cloud being involved. So um, migrate live and you don't need to purchase Maxava. It's a short term um, uh, exercise. Wonderful, thank you. And we just have another question here. Uh, what versions of the operating system do Maxava support? Okay, so we, su we support uh, 7.5 and typically we, we, we support whatever the latest is and we do it on the day of release because we get um, early release of the software before anybody else. Um, but we go all the way back to 5.3, V5R3. And I guess a side note there is it's not a cut down or an old version that runs on these older operating systems. It's the same version. So it really doesn't matter to us. Um, I think 5.3 was probably around about 20 years ago. So it doesn't matter to us what version you're using. Maxalva can support you. Okay, wonderful. Um, we have a question from Sean. Um, how simple is it to fail over if a disaster happens with the source server? Yep, um, I'll take that, Ash. Yep. Um, good question. Um, I, I didn't have a chance to go through all of these. So there is a simple command, um, well, three simple commands. We have a, what we call a change role, which allows you to say, I want my target server to be production and you run that one command and all of the scripts which are attached to that can be executed so it can perform some local changes as well for you um, and we start replication back in the opposite direction now that's more of a controlled situation so for the the more disastrous disaster uh, we have a command called mx failover and that command is run on the target server to say right the other box has gone this is my new box and it runs that and all its associated scripts um, and gets you up and running as quickly as possible. Normally, our part of that changeover to prepare the, the target server to be used as production for you takes 10 to 15 minutes. And I'll guarantee you've got many, many other things that you'll be doing uh, that could take longer than that, whether getting your users access, accessing to that system, um, and all of the other setup that you'll need to do and the checks that you need to make. Um, but yeah, our element of that is a very, very short 10, 15 minutes. Uh, thank you, Martin. Um, there's a follow-up question here. What is the average cost to set up and install? Um, I, I guess I can I can try to take that one. Sure. It's, um, it, it's really difficult to quantify, actually. Um, what we tend to do to start with is we will install and run something called uh, the technical discovery report or utility um, that goes away goes away and has a look at the uh, I guess the moving parts the general makeup of your system um, and produces a, a nice word document for us to look at and from that we can tell typically how many hours or how many days a particular migration will take so it tells us if you're running the IBM MQ it tells us whether you've got maybe physical files and logical files in different libraries and those kind of things. So it indicates how, how simple or how difficult uh, that migration will be. So that would be the first port of call. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. And I think that is it for questions for now, but um, absolutely, we'll, we will be continuing the conversation. Uh, we are at the top of the hour, so I'd like to thank everybody for joining today. I will give about um, just a, a quick second uh, for Chad, if he'd like to say a couple of words at the very end. Um, Chad is our business development manager at Sentia. So um, if you would like to have a, a deeper dive, please connect with Chad. And uh, Chad, if you do want to, if you have a couple of um, if comments that you'd like to make, please feel free to do so right now. Sure, thanks. So at first, I'd like to thank you all for joining and for the questions. Um, one point I want to make is that we we took the time to put this on to disparate system so that you could actually see what happens in real time. You know, it would have been easier to have it all done at MaxSave or all done at Centia. 
but we wanted to show you what it really looks like uh, in real time. So if you want to see a further demonstration or you want to continue the discussion, please reach out to me and I'll schedule that. Thanks again for coming. Thank you, Chad. And on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we certainly hope that you found today's session insightful and informative. Thank you to Paul, Ash, and Martin for presenting, and a recording of the session will be sent out shortly after the session. Thank you again.